Jim, welcome and congratulations on the new role. Well, thanks very much. Uh, it's great to be here. It's great to have you. Uh, before we get into your new role, I want to get your reaction to Fed Chair Pell's speech. Yeah, I thought it was moderately hawkish. Uh, he cited uh, things that he said in the past, uh, but in particular, I think that uh, GDP growth is not really slowing down. It was above trend in the first half of 2023, and now it looks like the third quarter will also be very strong. Uh, labor market remains uh, very strong. Unemployment still three and a half percent. So he mentioned these things in the uh, speech and said that the committee may have to go higher on the policy rate. Uh, I think he's uh, this is just reflecting the reality of the data that's coming in. Uh, they're really not seeing the below trend uh, growth that you would need, uh, nor the weakening of the labor market uh, that they had expected. You were long one of the most hawkish members of the FOMC, and you sat on the committee in June when we saw that you guys had penciled in two more rate hikes for the remainder of this year. Having listened to Pell's speech this morning, do you think there is more than one rate hike on the table for the remainder of this year after the speech? Well, of course, uh, uh, the chair is uh, very careful in assessing the situation, as is the committee, and, and uh, they'll be data dependent. But right now, it looks like the data is not uh, cooperating the way they would have thought. Unemployment is still three and a half, uh, you know, and this faster growth now, a real acceleration in the economy. Uh, that sounds like a higher rate path than what you would have otherwise thought. Um, inflation has come down, but as the chair said in the speech, it's really the headline inflation number that's come down. The core numbers have come down a little bit, but not that much yet. And so you'd have to see sustained uh, disinflation there uh, in order to keep the committee at bay here, I think. Yeah, to your point, even though uh, we saw some cooling in the past couple inflation reports, the data uh, on core inflation is still quite high. Do you think that the Fed could pull the trigger to raise rates at the September policy meeting? Uh, I think they've got optionality for that. They could do that if, uh, if so desired. They've got uh, some more data coming in before then. Uh, another way to do it would be to wait uh, for a meeting. Um, maybe they would play it that way. I do think, you know, the committee's in much better shape than they were last year at this time or 18 months ago. Uh, so they made a lot of moves last year when I was on the committee, uh, 75 basis point moves at four consecutive meetings. Uh, so that went a long way uh, toward helping. But how to fine tune this and how to adjust this in the second half of 2023 is going to be a good, good question, but they'll stay data dependent and they'll take a look at uh, how the, uh, what's happening. But I think if you get this reacceleration, that's a that's a serious matter and the committee will have to uh, uh, address that. So it sounds like they could wait till November to collect more data. Is that is that what you're thinking? But I mean, where is this reacceleration going? I mean, you've got uh, GDP now uh, from the Atlanta Fed. You're two months into this quarter, and they're you know it's very close to six percent annual growth rate. I mean, it's ridiculously high. Uh, maybe it's quirky, uh, but uh, uh, what if that drove unemployment down to tick down further? Uh, and what if the inflation number stalls a little bit? In those kinds of scenarios, I think you might get some movement. Uh, by the committee, but they'll, they'll be data dependent. They'll wait and see uh, how the data come in. I want to ask you, Jim, about Treasury yields, because we have seen long term Treasury yields surge uh, to their highest levels since pre financial crisis. Uh, how do you think the Fed is looking at these in the context of, of setting rates? Is, is the bond market doing some of the work for the Fed or is it just cooperating now? Uh, your thoughts on that? Uh, it is uh, cooperating a little bit. The bond market sometimes is at odds with the Fed, but sometimes cooperating. I would say, though, that the biggest thing about understanding these yields is that the uh, Silicon Valley Bank situation in March caused uh, a dramatic easing of financial conditions. And then uh, a lot of people bought into the narrative that that was going to be the trigger that would cause recession for the U.S. economy. That hasn't really panned out. And I think what's happening is that that's uh, now uh, the market has to retrace 
And so uh, the lower bond yields that were in place in the second quarter are, having, are being replaced by higher yields in the third quarter here. And that makes total sense because the, uh, the SVB situation did not turn into a catalyst for recession. Yeah, so let's talk about, uh, you know, the terminal rate is one thing, right? But holding rates at extended levels for a period of time is an another thing. Do you think that the market is underestimating just how long the Fed could hold rates at heightened levels and, and see a five handle really on the Fed funds rate? Uh, I, I think they might be. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, the chair didn't say anything about cutting uh, rates today. And as far as I know, in public comments, I haven't heard anything uh, like that except outside the Fed. So the, the people inside the Fed are definitely thinking uh, that they want to see the core inflation come down more dramatically before they uh, decide to make a change in policy. And if anything, the risks are piling up to the upside of the policy rate that there might be further increases ahead if we get this reacceleration of the economy in the second half of 2023. Jim, why do you think the economy has remained so resilient in the face of 11 rate hikes? Is it that the lags are longer the cycle around or just frankly, the Fed has more work to do? Uh, I think uh, Part of the rate hike cycle has been to just get off the very low zero rates, near zero rates that were associated with the pandemic. So part of the rate hikes were just to get back to some sort of neutral or normal uh, level of the policy rate. Then the committee had to go above that level and uh, uh, up to the you know five handle on the on the policy rate. So. Not all of it has been tightening policy. Some of it was just getting back to normal. Um, so that's one thing I think to understand. Uh, the other thing is that the U.S. economy is uh, pretty resilient. You have this residual fiscal policy hangover from the pandemic. Uh, those savings are being spent down now by the household sector, but still uh, uh, consumption is, is uh, pretty robust. And it's exactly what you would think. If the labor market is pretty robust, then usually consumption follows right behind that and you get a pretty strong economy. Consumption is a big trunk of the uh, GDP. So um, it, it does make sense uh, to some degree uh, that uh, you'd be able to raise the policy rate dramatically uh, without going into recession. Jim, you are in your first week of classes as dean of Purdue's business uh, school. A major change for you, having served uh, in the Federal Reserve System for so many years. How does it feel? What do you hope to accomplish? Uh, the Daniel School of Business has a lot of momentum behind it, a lot of backing, a lot of passion. Uh, I think we'll be able to build on the success that's already here and and create a distinctive uh, business school proposition. Purdue is number four in the nation in engineering. Uh, we're closely associated with the engineering school. We'll do more to uh, integrate that together and create an even better brand. Our graduates do very well because they have a lot of technical background. And so we're expecting that to be uh, uh, the basis of our success going forward. Now that you're an educator, I can call you uh, Dean Bullard. Uh, what do we do about this trillion dollar plus student loan situation? You know, President Biden tried to cancel student debt. Uh, you saw the Supreme Court uh, smack that down. He's tried to put forth another plan. But this is really a long standing issue. How do we fix the system? Well, one of the things that Mitch Daniels did at, here at Purdue when he was president was he froze tuition for over a decade. Uh, so uh, Purdue has a much lower price point than uh, the other major business schools. This means that our students don't have to take on a lot of debt and they graduate with one of the lowest uh, debt ratios uh, of any business school in the country so or any uh, university in the country. So uh, we think we've got a good solution on that. Um, I think uh, for others that uh, where they're racking up a, a lot of debt, uh, they have to do that uh, very carefully and uh, they have to have a plan to pay it back and a plan to get a job that will enable them to pay it back. So this has been 
very difficult uh, situation across the country, uh, but we've got a good solution here at Purdue, we think. Jim, thanks so much for your insight. It's so appreciated. Look forward to hopefully talking to you again soon. Thanks so much for having me.